course, we've just had Women's Day on Friday. Thank you to those who came to our morning concert. It was a lovely time ahead by all those ladies who really entertained us um, from the top of the charts. And it was a great morning. I trust that all the females in our midst did have a happy Women's Day on Friday and that you were at least a little spoiled. My mind thus automatically went to some women in the Bible. I thought, I better stick to this whole seasonal thing. It's women's month and all. So I need to get some kind of significant woman in the scriptures to talk on this morning. And I just didn't feel particularly inspired by Ruth or Esther or one of those guys, sorry, one of those girls. And so my mind went to the New Testament and I got hypnotized, if you like, by one of the women Jesus ministered to. I'm going to read to us from Luke chapter 8. And what we are looking at today is actually a miracle on the way to another miracle. This little miracle that Jesus performs with this woman is tucked into a passage which actually has much more to say and much more to make clear. You'll see what I mean. Luke chapter 8. I prepared from a Bible at home and I've just taken this one off so why am I not Chapter 8, as from verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, ah, I'm not mistaken. Something has happened here. Somebody has touched me, for I could feel the power leaving my body. Then the woman, seeing that she wouldn't be able to pull this off without being noticed, came trembling and fell at Jesus' in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. The passage then continues uh, by saying that somebody then ran from Jairus' house back to Jesus, saying, You know what, Jesus, you needn't bother because this little 12 year old girl, where you didn't get in time, um, actually died. So, you know, you win some, you lose some, sort of thing. Can you see how this miracle of a bleeding woman is a miracle on the way to another miracle? And if one is not careful, one could miss the eternal truth locked up in this important incident of a woman who had suffered for many, many years, found restoration and wholeness. It's probably no surprise that my sermon for today has three points. I don't want to deviate Sunday after Sunday. I gave you a one-pointer last week, and you already coped with that, so I'm going to go back to what you know, okay? A three-point sermon. What do we glean from this very <coughs> really meaningful passage of a woman who had 
lived for 12 long, drawn out, painful, embarrassing years being healed. The first thing that I noticed was that she was really and truly desperate. That she was running out of hope fast and that her faith was holding on by a very thin thread. I had worked it out, I'm not 100% sure if the years were the same length as they are today, but let's say they were. If she had been bleeding for 12 years, that would have been 4,380 days of intense suffering. That is a long time. It's more than a quarter of my life, I calculate. For your life, it would be only a small portion, but it's not for me. Okay? I don't know if anybody ever paid attention to the fact that the daughter of Jairus, where Jesus was on his way to, was also 12 years of age. So there's some kind of connection there, some kind of correlation. It's like Matthew, or it's like the synoptic authors are wanting to tell us that. What, how this, for how long this woman had suffered, it had been somebody else's entire life. Not only had she struggled and suffered for 12 years, she had also, according to Luke's version of the story, spent all she had on doctors. Every penny that she had available to her had been used to find expert advice from medical professionals. That's quite something as Luke includes that verse, because Luke himself was a doctor. And I wonder if Luke would have had some kind of remedy for this poor soul. Maybe not, because it looks like she had been up and down the ladder. Doctor in and doctor out tried this hospital, went to that clinic, applied to this <coughs> convalescent home, and nothing but nothing worked. I read in one of the New Testament commentaries that some of the solutions that a doctor would um, invariably have offered her would have been quite questionable indeed. We're talking 2,000 years ago, so you must imagine in your mind how primitive the remedies would have been. I know for piles, for instance, the doctors told people to apply honey and then jump over a hole in the ground one meter deep about 30 times and then expect for everything to be better. That was the kind of advice available to the average person in the time of Jesus. Who knows what weird and wonderful suggestions they would have made to this desperate person. Not only was there a physical element to her pain and to her suffering, there was also the social element. Because of her condition, she would have been declared very clearly unclean at the temple. In other words, she was not welcome in the house of God. I'm not even sure if she would have been allowed to speak to anybody half religious. I don't know if she was even allowed to come a ten foot pole distance to the four courts of the temple on Mount Zion. Not only had she ended up frail and emaciated, she was also branded unclean. No one wanted to go near her. She must have felt very, felt very unwelcome and unloved. She must have been ostracized because who would have wanted to make her their best friend? Probably no one. After 12 years, 
It could also be that her husband left, that her children had forgotten all about her faith, and it could very well be that she was all alone in the world. Can you see? Can you feel? Can you sense the level of her desperation? Can you think in your mind's eye of what she would have looked like after 12 years of hemorrhaging? There must have been very little left of her. She must have been scrawny and gaunt, colorless, just skin and bone. Her problem was serious. And the situation desperate. Maybe at the beginning, in the first year or two, her friends still hung around. Maybe they thought, we'll be able to do this. We will stick it out with, what shall we call her, Chloe. But then when nothing changed, surely they also gave up and turned their backs. And so on this fateful day, she had no choice. She had to push through the crowd, and she had to touch the hem of his garment. She had to give this a try. This was her last hope. This was her only option. The Gospel of Mark, in his version, tells us, that she had heard stories about Jesus. That he wasn't a total stranger to her. That she had heard rumors on the street saying that there's this unorthodox rabbi doing his rounds through the villages in the countryside. Perhaps there could be something there. A meeting with Jesus was all she had. This is how desperate she must have been after 12 long years. In her desperation, there's only one thing <coughs> she could do, and that was go to Jesus. How often have you been desperate in your life? I can remember three categorical instances in which I was left desperate and bereft. I have from the pulpit in front here often referred to my friends drowning in 2009. It's coming up for 15 years on the 2nd of September. And that traumatic day I will never ever forget. I remember how we went to the NSRI office in PE at the harbor there, waiting for his body to be found or not. Eventually they discovered his kayak without him in it. And then 12 o'clock midday the news came. The officer in charge walked towards us and did this. I will never forget that day, and I will never forget the desperation and the and, and the disheartenment and the brokenheartedness and the depression and the loneliness that followed. He was only 37, and he and I were the two ministers at St. John's Methodist Church, and we were going to take that church to the next level, and now all of a sudden there was nothing left of that dream. He left behind a devastated wife and a four-year-old boy and a two-year-old daughter, which of course has no recollection of her day. I cannot tell you how desperate the grief that ensued made me feel. I was There was a professor of psychology in the congregation. 
and he spent two and a quarter years with me, helping me to get over the loss of that. And I remember so vividly talking to him about my loneliness at the time. And how I saw the loneliness as a person, as a masked phantom that would come into my flat at night and haunt the living daylights out of me. I have been there. I have been desperate. How desperate have you been in your life? How close have you come to having lost all hope? How often have you arrived in pain, whether it's been physical or emotional or even spiritual. How often have you been in a place of once and for all wanting to give up all together because the road was just too long for you and the night was just too dark and you had convinced yourself that nothing would ever come right for you ever again. Surely somewhere along the line, in this fallen world, you've been there. In a state of unspeakable desperation. How often have people not come to see me as a pastor? Not because they are desperate for themselves necessarily, but desperate for their children. How often have you not come to me discussing the detail of your child's circumstances with me while the tears were flowing freely? I was so desperate several years ago when my path was stolen in Verizon in Johannesburg on the West Strand. Now, for those who know me, you know that my car is a second home, you know, and I live in it. And one, one area of the car is like a study, and one area is like a kitchen, and the other is like a wardrobe. It's like a little, little apartment on wheels. So everything is kept in my car so that I can have it in handy, you know. <laughs> I, 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 I want to be versed up. I want to be there when it happens. So I want to have a Bible. I want to have a coffee. I want to have some cheese. And I want to have a New Testament commentary by William Barclay. So all of that is held in my car 24-7. And so when those thieves got away with my brand new polo, it shattered me beyond I was particularly sad because of the number plate I had lost. It said FHP 190, and I always interpreted that to mean fiery hot preacher. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I got to the police station, lamenting the fact that my clerical cloak and that my home communion set and that all of my dog collars had also gone with the car, all that the policeman could say to me is, Reverend, let me tell you that somebody in Mozambique is probably already pretending to be an ordained clergy. <laughs> <laughs> there come moments in our lives, although we chuckle nervously now, <coughs> there come moments in our lives of sheer and raw this. But she knew what to do, and she knew where to go. And so she did. The second thing, the second observation that I've got from this passage, it, it, it's, it's not only true that this woman was very, very, very desperate. We, we also see that from Jesus' side, he clearly saw her. And I want to make a big fuss of this point this morning. For it changes the narrative once and for all. I don't know if it's just me, but it looks like Jesus made 
this woman to feel as if she was the most important person in the world. He gave her a deep sense that she was not only a number, that she mattered to him and that she mattered greatly to him. Don't you also get that feeling from the passage? It, 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 it said there that she went to Jesus from behind, from the back. I mean, you did notice that when I read the passage, right? So, so this could mean that she wanted to keep a low profile. She probably had a low self-esteem. She didn't want the sounding of trumpets on the day of her healing. She just wanted the bleeding to stop. She must have been so physically drained and so emotionally empty and so unutterably weak. But she knew that she had to get to Jesus. She must have been at least a little scared of what he would say. That's why she went so discreetly to him. Hey? She must have worried about what his reaction would be. She must have worried that he would chase her away, that he would reject her, or at least ask her kindly to leave and mind her own business. He was already on his way somewhere to Jairus' daughter, remember? She had no place there. That wasn't her context. She didn't only end up making the story more interesting and intriguing. No, right here in Luke chapter 8, we have this important lesson that Jesus sees people. For it's recorded there that Jesus turned around and saw her. He saw her and he welcomed her. <coughs> He saw her and he welcomed her and he received her and he accepted her and he ministered to her and he said to her, you are precious in my sight. Jesus sees me. It's easy to forget because it's a passage we didn't read. The passage that goes before. It's easy to forget that Jesus by this time had had a very hectic day. Jesus had just calmed the storm, which must have been quite a harrowing experience for him. And Jesus had also just had the experience of freeing a demon-possessed man from all the demons that were living inside of him. It's a whole pig story where the, where, the, where, the, where the demons fled into the pigs and they ran into the sea. That precedes this passage. So Jesus' day had already been quite tiring. Jesus had just arrived in, back in Galilee by boat and he probably was in the mood for quite a chilled, laid-back day. The last thing that he felt like was addressing another emergency. But because it was Jairus, I suppose he had to go. And then this woman also pops out of nowhere needing some attention. The fact that Jesus, in spite of his exhaustion, still pauses in the middle of the street, in spite of the thronging crowds, must mean that God sees that God sees the well-being of people as a priority. And today I want you to know that He sees you also. That He doesn't look past you or tries to pretend that you don't exist. You are not just a number to Him. You are not just another desperado needing healing. You're not just another chance-taking woman looking for salvation. You are not just another brick in the wall. You are not just another sinner in the system. No, He sees you and He knows you and He hears your crying for 
right now. You are not just a number to him. Let's talk about the whole Jairus issue for a minute or two. So Jesus didn't expect to, right in the middle of the street, have to quickly have a convo with an unnamed woman. No, he was on a mission. Jairus had called for him, and that is where he was going to go. There was a 12-year-old dying for goodness sake. Surely if he had a to-do list, this would be right at the top for this day. Anyway, Jairus was a celebrity. The supervisor of the local synagogue. Some versions have the word leader, but I think we need to just pad that a little bit. I think he was probably a, a, a mini celeb in society. He was the superintendent of the synagogue. And as I say that, those words just drip with a bit of clout and influence, don't they? He was a big shot. And Jesus had a chance of doing a favor for somebody quite important. The disciples always enjoyed a bit of glitz and glamour, so they put pressure on Jesus. Jesus, let's not waste any time. In fact, put a bit of a run in your step. Let's get to Jairus' house as quickly as possible. You see, they loved all the fanfare. But Jesus, Jesus refuses to play into that. For you know why? Every person is important to him. Every person. Even the incognito woman who's got only one card left to play. Every person matters to Christ. Every person. Gosh, I should have brought my notes. I knew I was going to forget something. Um, let me just rest my brain. You might feel like you are bothering him when you pray. You might feel as if you are un too unworthy to ask him to step into your life. You might feel like you're at the bottom of the pecking order. You might feel like God, God's only looking out for the super spiritual, like pastors, for instance, or a bishop, maybe. But those thoughts are untrue. If you think that God is looking out only for the churchy, or only for the religious, or only for those who pray a heck of a lot, then you are wrong. Dear friend, God has your back also. And God is telling me to tell you today that He cares for you. The last thing I better say on this passage, because now we are running out of time, is this. In this whole healing scenario taking place in Luke chapter 8, it seems as if faith played a role. So, so, so where we act, firstly, we, we've noticed the woman's desperation, right? Secondly, we, we, we've acknowledged that Jesus saw her. And thirdly, I think we better discuss for our own good the fact that she had at least a bit of faith. Like a mustard seed's worth, for instance. I, I can't find anything in the passage that suggests that this woman had stacks of faith. I really can't. I studied it up till 2 a.m. last night. I, I would know. Okay? <laughs> I've searched around in this passage and I've consulted four different versions of the New Testament, not to mention all these commentaries that, 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 that I've tried to consult. Nothing has suggested that this woman was a faith giant. It 
was that she on this day scraped together all the little bits of faith lying all over her imperfect life. It's like she scraped together all the tidbits of faith and said, okay, now this is the faith with which I'm going to pro approach Jesus. And that was enough. It sufficed. You see, it's not how much you believe. Sometimes it's not even about what you believe. It's who you believe in. Thinking that something good happened to her. And so I want to negate this thing. That you must have stacks of faith in order to see God working in your life. I want to define this belief which says that you have to be a faith giant in order for God to do a miracle for you in your frailty and in your frustration. No. A little bit of faith the size of a mustard seed is all it takes. She knew in her heart of hearts that she had to get to Jesus. And so she burst through the crowd with her last ounce of energy. <clears throat> if only I can touch the hem of his garment. That's all. She did it. And the rest I suppose the question I need to ask now is this. How, how earnestly do you want to get to Jesus? How desperate are you to get to Him? Is there this irreplaceable desire to get to Him no matter what? To call upon His name, to seek His face. <clears throat> this woman gave Jesus a shot. She took the step of faith, and Jesus recognized it. He even goes as far in the end to call her daughter. There's a, an, an old song from my childhood that comes to mind. Reach out and touch the Lord as he passes by. You will find him not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He is passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as he I hope that you didn't mind me deviating from Lamentations 3 verse 55. I think we've been sick of that passage now after I've done dealt with it twice, two summers in a row. So here's my proclamation for this morning then. A woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, 4,380 days. She was desperate like we sometimes are. But Jesus saw her. Whatever faith she had to offer sufficed. Get to Jesus today. Don't waste any more time. Not a single second. Reach out and touch the Lord. And I promise you, something good will happen to you. Amen. I want us to see that chorus. Reach out and touch the Lord.
so many times where we feel indescribably weak. Where we wonder if we're going to survive. But we pray for you to lift us up and for you to make us strong. Lord, there is nothing that we can hide from you. Don't show our brokenness to all the world, but you know that deep within we are fractured. And some of us are bleeding, and some of us are silently crying. Some of us are crippled by our loneliness, some of us are stumbling over all our fears. We pray for your healing touch for our lives, for your divine intervention, and for you to make a way for us. Even there where a way seems to be impossible. We reach out to you now as you pass by, and we believe that you are not too busy to hear our hearts cry. So, Lord, embrace us with your tender embrace. Tell us again that we matter and that we are precious to you. <coughs> and remind us of your care. For you care for us. Always have.
goodbye very quickly. The 10 o'clock people are going to arrive soon. Okay, so goodbye everybody. Stella, are you going to be ready for ministry? Immediately after the service, Stella will stand by to pray with you or for you um, as, as you need. Next week, two services. I will be here for both. What can I say? 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock. A blessed Sunday to everyone, the benediction. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all today and every day. Amen.